Around the World in 80 Days By Jules Verne Chapter 14 In which Phileas Fogg descends the whole length of the beautiful valley of the gangs without ever thinking of seeing IT. The rash exploit had been accomplished, and for an hour past Sephardt laughed gaily at his success. Sir Francis pressed the worthy fellow's hand, and his master said, Well done. Which, from him, was high commendation, to which Passepartout replied that all the credit of the affair belonged to Mr. Fogg. As for him, he had only been struck with a queer idea, and he laughed to think that for a few moments he, Passepartout, the ex-gymnast, ex-sergeant fireman, had been the spouse of a charming woman, a venerable, embalmed Raja. As for the young Indian woman, she had been unconscious throughout of what was passing, and now, wrapped up in a traveling blanket, was reposing in one of the howdahs. The elephant, thanks to the skillful guidance of the Parsi, was advancing rapidly through the still darksome forest, and, an hour after leaving the pagoda, had crossed a vast plain. They made a halt at seven o'clock, the young woman being still in a state of complete prostration. The guide made her drink a little brandy and water, but the drowsiness which stupefied her could not yet be shaken off. Sir Francis, who was familiar with the effects of the intoxication produced by the fumes of hemp, reassured his companions on her account. But he was more disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Phileas Fogg that, should Aoudal remain in India, she would inevitably fall again into the hands of her executioners. These fanatics were scattered throughout the county, and would, despite the English police, recover their victim in Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She would only be safe by quitting India forever. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect upon the matter. The station at Allahabad was reached about 10 o'clock, and, the interrupted line of railway being resumed, would enable them to reach Calcutta in less than 24 hours. Phileas Fogg would thus be able to arrive in time to take the steamer which left Calcutta the next day, October 25th, at noon, for Hong Kong. The young woman was placed in one of the waiting rooms of the station, whilst Passepartout was charged with purchasing for her various articles of toilet, a dress, shawl, and some furs, for which his master gave him unlimited credit. Passepartout started off forthwith, and found himself in the streets of Allahabad, that is, the city of God, one of the most venerated in India, being built at the junction of the two sacred rivers, Ganges and Jamuna, the waters of which attract pilgrims from every part of the peninsula. The Ganges, according to the legends of the Ramayana, rises in heaven, whence, owing to Brahma's agency, it descends to the earth. Passepartout made it a point, as he made his purchases, to take a good look at the city. It was formerly defended by a noble fort, which has since become a state prison, its commerce has dwindled away, and Passepart out in vain looked about him for such a bazaar as he used to frequent in Regent Street. At last he came upon an elderly, crusty Jew, who sold second-hand articles, and from whom he purchased a dress of scotch stuff, a large mantle, and a fine otter skin police, for which he did not hesitate to pay 75 pounds. He then returned triumphantly to the station, the influence to which the priests of Pillage had subjected Aoda began gradually to yield, and she became more herself, so that her fine eyes resumed all their soft Indian expression. When the poet king, Yukaf Adal, celebrates the charms of the Queen of Amanagara, he speaks thus. Her shining tresses, divided in two parts, encircled the harmonious contour of her wide and delicate cheeks, brilliant in their glow and freshness. Her ebony brows have the form and charm of the bow of Kama, the god of love, and beneath her long silken lashes the purest reflections and a celestial light swim, as in the sacred lakes of Himalaya, in the black pupils of her great clear eyes. Her teeth, fine, equal, and white, glitter between her smiling lips like dewdrops in a passion flower's half-enveloped breast. Her delicately formed ears, her vermilion hands, her little feet, curved and tender as the lotus bud, glitter with the brilliancy of the loveliest pearls of Ceylon, the most dazzling diamonds of Golconda. Her narrow and supple waist, which a hand may clasp around, sets forth the outline of her rounded figure and the beauty of her bosom, where youth in its flower displays the wealth of its treasures, 
and beneath the silken folds of her tunic she seems to have been modeled in pure silver by the godlike hand of Vikvar Karma, the immortal sculptor. It is enough to say, without applying this poetical rhapsody to Aota, that she was a charming woman, in all the European acceptation of the phrase. She spoke English with great purity, and the guide had not exaggerated in saying that the young Parsi had been transformed by her bringing up. The train was about to start from Allahabad, and Mr. Fogg proceeded to pay the guide the price agreed upon for his service, and not a farthing more, which astonished Passepartout, who remembered all that his master owed to the guide's devotion. He had, indeed, risked his life in the adventure at Pillagy, and, if he should be caught afterwards by the Indians, he would with difficulty escape their vengeance. Kayuni, also, must be disposed of. What should be done with the elephant, which had been so dearly purchased? Phileos Fogg had already determined this question. Parsi, said he to the guide, you have been serviceable and devoted. I have paid for your service, but not for your devotion. Would you like to have this elephant? He is yours. The guide's eyes glistened. Your honor is giving me a fortune. Cried he. Take him, guide, returned Mr. Fogg, and I shall still be your debtor. Good! exclaimed Passepertout. Take him, friend. Kayuni is a brave and faithful beast. And, going up to the elephant, he gave him several lumps of sugar, saying, Here, Kayuni, here, here. The elephant grunted out his satisfaction, and, clasping Passepartout around the waist with his trunk, lifted him as high as his head. Passepartout, not in the least alarmed, caressed the animal, which replaced him gently on the ground. Soon after, Phileos Fogg, Sir Francis Cromarty, and Passepartout, installed in a carriage with Aota, who had the best seat, were whirling at full speed towards Benares. It was a run of 80 miles, and was accomplished in two hours. During the journey, the young woman fully recovered her senses. What was her astonishment to find herself in this carriage, on the railway, dressed in European habiliments, and with travelers who were quite strangers to her. Her companions first set about fully reviving her with a little liquor, and then Sir Francis narrated to her what had passed, dwelling upon the courage with which Phileas Fogg had not hesitated to risk his life to save her, and recounting the happy sequel of the venture, the result of Passepartout's rash idea. Mr. Fogg said nothing, while Passepartout, abashed, kept repeating that it wasn't worth telling. Aoda pathetically thanked her deliverers, rather with tears than words, her fine eyes interpreted her gratitude better than her lips. Then, as her thoughts strayed back to the scene of the sacrifice, and recalled the dangers which still menaced her, she shuddered with terror. Phileos Fogg understood what was passing in Aoda's mind, and offered, in order to reassure her, to escort her to Hong Kong where she might remain safely until the affair was hushed up, an offer which she eagerly and gratefully accepted. She had, it seems, a Parsi relation, who was one of the principal merchants of Hong Kong, which is wholly an English city, though on an island on the Chinese coast. At half past twelve the train stopped at Benares. The Brahmin legends assert that this city is built on the site of the ancient Kasi, which, like Muhammad's tomb, was once suspended between heaven and earth, though the Benares of today, which the Orientalists call the Athens of India, stands quite unpoetically on the solid earth, Passepertout caught glimpses of its brick houses and clay huts, giving an aspect of desolation to the place, as the train entered it. Benares was Sir Francis Cromarty's destination, the troops he was rejoining being encamped some miles northward of the city. He bade adieu to Phileas Fogg, wishing him all success, and expressing the hope that he would come that way again in a less original but more profitable fashion. Mr. Fogg lightly pressed him by the hand. The parting of Aota, who did not forget what she owed to Sir Francis, betrayed more warmth, and, as for Passepartout, he received a hearty shake of the hand from the gallant general. The railway, on leaving Benores, passed for a while along the valley of the gangs. Through the windows of their carriage the travelers had glimpses of the diversified landscape of beer, with its mountains clothed in verdure, its fields of barley, wheat, and corn, its jungles peopled with green alligators, its neat villages, 
and its still thickly leaved forests. Elephants were bathing in the waters of the sacred river, and groups of Indians, despite the advanced season and chilly air, were performing solemnly their pious ablutions. These were fervent Brahmins, the bitterest foes of Buddhism, their deities being Vishnu, the solar god, Shiva, the divine impersonation of natural forces, and Brahma, the supreme ruler of priests and legislators. What would these divinities think of India, anglicized as it is today, with steamers whistling and scudding along the gangs, frightening the gulls which float upon its surface, the turtles swarming along its banks, and the faithful dwelling upon its borders. The panorama passed before their eyes like a flash, save when the steam concealed it fitfully from the view, the travelers could scarcely discern the fort of Chupini, 20 miles southwestward from Benares, the ancient stronghold of the Rajas Abir, or Gazipur and its famous rose water factories, or the tomb of Lord Cornwallis, rising on the left bank of the Gangs, the fortified town of Buxar, or Patna, a large manufacturing and trading place, where is held the principal opium market of India, or Mwanghir, a more than European town, for it is as English as Manchester or Birmingham, with its iron foundries, edge tool factories, and high chimneys puffing clouds of black smoke heavenward. Night came on, the train passed on at full speed, in the midst of the roaring of the tigers, bears, and wolves which fled before the locomotive, in the marvels of Bengal, Golconda ruined Gur, Murshedabad, the ancient capital, Burdwan, Hugli, and the French town of Chandernagar, where Passepartat would have been proud to see his country's flag flying, were hidden from their view in the darkness. Calcutta was reached at 7 in the morning, and the packet left for Hong Kong at noon, so that Phileas Fogg had five hours before him. According to his journal, he was due at Calcutta on the 25th of October, and that was the exact date of his actual arrival. He was therefore neither behind hand nor ahead of time. The two days gained between London and Bombay had been lost, as has been seen, in the journey across India. But it is not to be supposed that Phileas Fogg regretted them. This is end of the chapter 14. If you like this story, please like, share and subscribe. Thank you.